Assembly Hall Pride of Indiana is made possible by CurryAutoCenter.com, listing Curry's entire selection of all makes of new and used vehicles on Facebook and located by the College Mall on Auto Mall Road, supporting the community for more than 100 years. CFC Properties, restoring and preserving the historic presence of downtown Bloomington. CFC's revitalization projects include Fountain Square Mall, Grant Street Inn, and the Yoho General Store, also offering residential apartments, including the Kirkwood. CFCProperties.com. IU Credit Union, offering three IU Athletic debit cards featuring IU Hoosier designs, available at all IU Credit Union locations. More information at IUCU.org. IU Credit Union, we started a credit union and created a community. Meadowood Retirement Community, an active adult living community adjacent to IU, offering a community of friends and Lifestyle 360 activities for healthy lifestyles. MeadowoodRetirement.com And by WTIU members. Thank you! In the middle of the last century, the fall of 1950, a public school of higher education envisioned change, a big change change which would have wide-ranging effects throughout campus. The financial and emotional aftermath would be felt for years to come. In 1956, Indiana University began to expand northward with a new vision. And the Ferris family had a farm out in that area, and in 1956, Indiana bought that land. When Herman Wells engineered the purchase of the Ferris farm, though a master plan was put together that would allow for the construction of a new football stadium, of a basketball arena, and the field house. Assembly Hall was designed in 1955. It was bid once and came in over uh, bonding capability of the university and so it was held for 10 years until the bond market became more favorable. Plans for the assembly hall were put on the shelf for another day and indeed remained there for almost 10 years. So there was some controversy about how it might be paid for and the only available um, avenue for financial support was through the student fee and the uh, assembly hall was, as I said, put on the shelf. The Assembly Hall ended up being built uh, despite the fact that a lot of students didn't want it built, including the student body president, Guy Lofman. And it was about a $14.5 million project, but the only viable source of funds was to tack it on to the, um, the dedicated student fee, which was part of tuition. Between my freshman and sophomore year in, uh, in college, I believe it was like a hundred or more percent increase in tuition. I got nothing against a great basketball hall, but I don't think it should be paid, f you know, four by 85 percent from student tuition. You know, the late 60s was a time to protest almost everything. I mean, the Vietnam War was hot, war was hot and heavy, and there were protests almost every day in Dunmeno. It was a culture of protest in those days. The first thing we did was try to get the numbers. So I said, well, can I see these records? They basically stonewalled me. Here were a place of free inquiry, but they eventually said I couldn't ask any more questions. I think the administration felt a need to answer the questions uh, properly, and but to just keep going over it and going over it and going over it. the same question, I, at some point just say, we answered that question. After they got done paying off the bonds that were originally issued, they still were short of money, and they had to issue another set of bonds to be paid for by more student tuition fees. And the final cost of Assembly Hall was about $26 million. Students wanted to be sure that would have a general use, particularly for concerts and other events on the campus. Architectural plans were made when they envisioned this entire athletic complex out there in the, in the 50s. And then they just dusted them off. So it was an obsolete building when it was built. Construction began in December of 1967. It was uh, just shy of four years in construction.
and somebody came up with the idea of we should take a look at the design of the North Carolina State Cattle Auction House, which is now called Dorton Arena. The roof was unique because it allowed for wide open spaces without poles that would uh, uh, impact view, uh, sight lines. And so the design is two parabolic arcs set at 45 degree angles to one another. They wanted to concentrate most of the seating on the sides as opposed to the end. And at the time, in most sports arenas, you don't want to have columns and supports in the way, so it was really innovative structurally with sort of a tension ring system uh, hung with cables at the top from uh, structural cables that actually supported the, the roof and, and the structure, so therefore there was unimpeded views and no, no columns or anything. It is a micro memorial stadium. The rake of the seats is the same. The openings into the facility are exactly the same. It's, it's the football stadium uh, pushed together and then uh, a, a suspension roof placed over the top. So that all was spun wire by wire in putting together 56 cables that are about three and a half inches in, in diameter. One very unfortunate incident occurred during the construction when an assembly hall uh, worker uh, actually fell from the catwalk, was killed uh, instantly. It opened in October of 1971. Dedication game came in December of 1971 when Indiana beat Notre Dame uh, 92 to 29. And the first event that was in assembly hall was a Bob Hope, Tula Clark concert, and I went to that. You know, it was initially built as a multi-purpose facility. Herman B. Wells was really big on wanting to make sure that it was a venue where we could host shows. With one loading dock that is a ramp, that's an inside turn. If you can imagine backing up a semi on your blind side and trying to get that into a loading ramp, that's definitely a challenge for even the most seasoned semi driver. Before Market Square Arena was built in Indianapolis, there was no place else for acts coming through Indiana to play in that size seating. So the Rolling Stones and Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley and all the, the huge acts that toured, if they stopped in Indiana, they stopped it in Bloomington, in Assembly Hall. They had to make the plans such that it would be a multi-use student assembly facility. And so what they wound up having was something that wasn't really great for anything. And the construction of it makes it that way. You know, you've got two big long sides and the stage is here. So you're trying to blow out the sound this way. So it's never had good sound. Just about everybody that was big came through. You had Elvis, and then you had Bob Dylan and the band, The Who, The Beach Boys, Grateful Dead, oh, Elton John, right, at the, right when his career really took off with uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. But at the time, Union Board was working with major promoters in the Midwest, Jam out of Chicago, uh, Sunshine Promotions out of Indianapolis, and they were putting large-scale shows in Assembly Hall. And of course, the touring industry was different that days, too. Uh, every band toured, you know, the record industry was different. You saw more people camped out for tickets. There was no such thing as online at all that didn't exist. So it was an event, and so there would be four or five concerts in Assembly Hall uh, every year. One of the things about scheduling concerts in Assembly Hall is you had to schedule around basketball. And that was during the Bob Knight era, so you had to schedule it around Bob Knight. And Bob Knight did not like having concerts in his hall. He called it his hall, his building, didn't like it. Very vocal about not liking it. See, we did a Chicago show. The team was playing in Notre Dame, at Notre Dame that night up in South Bend, and they, uh, they lost. And so we get a message that Bob Knight and the team are coming back and he wants to practice them now, tonight. So clear the place. Now, a major concert production, you know, there's, there's sound and lights rigged in, in the rafters. You know, there's a stage built. No way it's going to happen. No major show is done before 4 or 5 in the morning by the time they unrig everything and get it on the trucks and get out. And he comes storming in there, and of course there's still trucks and he has to get around, and he's screaming, cussing, throwing <laughs> throwing crap, break, <laughs> breaking things. And my, my only interaction with him, I was like, uh, Coach Knight, he's like, out of my way. So that was my interaction with Coach Knight during all my times while I was here on campus. So one of the very first shows, I think, after Bob Hope and Petula Clark, was the Barnum and Bailey Circus. So the circus people hated it. They said, we'll never come back. This is the worst place we've ever played in our lives. And the reason was the circus clowns, for example, you know, they go out and they mingle with the audience and they pull little stunts and so on. When they got out into assembly hall, they weren't looking at faces. They were looking at those walls on the side.
the building was planned to have an ice sheet of all things. The idea was that you could have uh, an ice rink down and then kind of roll in a uh, basketball floor over it or a floor over it that would uh, allow them to both play hockey in assembly hall and use it as, a, as an uh, event center. When I came here there was no ice hockey at all so what I decided to do is to start a uh, IU club team. I think the Indiana University with all the students that we have here would support it. There was a space down on court level for Zamboni. That space was roughed out but was never actually done. Bobby Knight was the basketball coach here at IU. He made sure that the arena area, the floor area, was small enough so that no ice hockey would be able to be installed on his floor. I really feel Knight had very little to do with the, the design of the facility because he came on, he came to Indiana after these things were really baked into the design. That decision ultimately wouldn't have been his because he wasn't here to make that decision. A long time ago, uh, Indiana decided that it was a basketball state and uh, having a permanent basketball floor um, in Assembly Hall is, is, uh, is a great advantage. Yeah, it's hard to fight basketball in Indiana. It's hard to fight, <laughs> tremendously hard. The Indiana Hoosiers men's basketball team was not the only championship team to play in Assembly Hall. The Indiana Pacers, we won three American Basketball Association championships, 1970, 72, and 73. We had a good run, about eight years. Of, we were in the championship series five times in eight years. A scheduling conflict at the Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum made the Pacers a part of Assembly Hall history. We were playing the, the New York uh, Nets uh, with Rick Barry, and our home games were played down in Bloomington as opposed to the, the Coliseum because they had a horse show. And it got into the championship series. Us against the New York Nets, and the Coliseum was booked, so we went to Bloomington. And we had a couple of ball games there, and we won them both. We won the series in six games in New York, but uh, yeah, we won a couple of couple ball games down there. George McGinnis was on the IU basketball team the year before Assembly Hall opened. His first chance to play there was as a professional athlete. It was incredible. I, you know, the, the seats just kind of went straight in the air, and I looked up at the top of the last row, and I thought, man, that's a long ways up there. And I wonder how comfortable a fan would be looking all the way down on that court. It was, it was an unusual building, but uh, by the same token, very beautiful. To many who watched games from Assembly Hall in the 1970s, one person became a symbol. Well, the mop lady, an interesting character. Her, her name was Martha Webster. She was a uh, lyric opera singer from Chicago and Cranfield Advertising wanted to create an opening for the telecast on Channel 4 of Indiana basketball. So they came up with a concept uh, for Indiana and, and one for the other school up in West Lafayette. Ours was a takeoff on Hazel the Maid that was the cartoon. They put her in a red wig and then the white starched outfit and the, and the red uh, small apron and, and she came down the East Court level hallway uh, humming and singing Indiana or Indiana. Most would agree, Assembly Hall presents a challenging place for an opposing team to play. The 75-76 year was when we went undefeated. And so every single game became important, no matter who you played. Everybody was trying to win every single game, and we, you know, achieved that in 75-76. It's been called the Carnegie Hall of College Basketball. Um, it's, it's, it's an iconic venue and one of the few ones 
left. So a lot of those are going the way of multi-purpose arenas, and I get that. Sometimes it's hard to know where you are because the multi-purpose tends to blend together. And I think it's really cool to have a place that, that's uh, unique and uh, it does provide the best home court advantage in college basketball. The one negative about Assembly Hall is it was not designed by a guy who was expert in basketball architecture. And, and you look at the ideal way of designing a gym, go up to a banker's life in Indianapolis. It, it emanates up, but it's also coming down. So I think that part of it, uh, you know, kind of cascading kind of uh, you know, and cascading, but almost simultaneously, if you can cascade simultaneously, that's the part that I think made it special. During certain games, it's unbelievable how loud it is. You can't talk to the person next to you. It's so loud. Um, it is got to be an intimidating place to play. Stacking all the seats on the side, I think produces a volume level in the assembly hall that reverberates off that high ceiling in a way that makes it tough to hear and tough to play in the assembly hall. It's been, a, it's a very unique building. When the, the fans are into it and when it's a rivalry game and a Big Ten game that matters, it can be in so incredibly loud. <laughs> it was pretty awesome, I have to say. Indiana University reached a tipping point to either raise assembly hall or to renovate it. The opinions were strong on both sides. Something needed to be done because there had been so much deferred maintenance that the place was almost literally falling apart. In the mid-2000s, the Board of Trustees looked at the master plan and said that uh, it might not be financially uh, reasonable to renovate Assembly Hall and that no new money should be uh, earmarked for improvements for it going forward. They wanted it uh, replaced. To replace Assembly Hall with the kind of capacity that we would want would be all of $300 million, $350 million would be a huge number. And so renovating it and trying to update it uh, without destroying the, the general spirit of the place was, was one of the biggest keys. There were teams that didn't, didn't want to play there, and that's what Coach Knight really wanted it to be. He wanted it to be a home court advantage, that the fans were going to be involved. We had to play at a high level because that's what he uh, worked us to, expected us to do, and in doing so, it made it difficult for teams to come in IU and beat us. I was hoping maybe they would go to more of a basketball arena, much like Bankers Fieldhouse. Uh, but they wanted to renovate it, and Cindy Simon Scott and Paul, they put up $40 million to change it. It's great that, that this kind lady has given a lot of money to Indiana University, and I appreciate it. I wish the whole assembly hall had been funded that way. The South Lobby is going to be a huge gathering point for Indiana fans, and there'll be a lot of memorabilia and virtual displays that'll be a part of that. It's going to be very exciting. We had to do something in concert with the existing building, so contextually we wanted it to fit in and match, uh, but at the same time, that portion be contemporary and new and, and of today's time, so I think it does both. I think it gives a presence to the sense of entry and builds a sense of community with the basically two and a half, three-story lobby, and it also opens up the facility in that we have glass both at the first floor level and the second floor with the new VIP suite that you can look into the arena, which you couldn't do before. We will replace all the seats. Those seats are kind of nasty if you think about what if it's 50 years of stuff soaking into those permeable uh, cushions. You can't begin to believe how many phone calls you can receive on the morning after a basketball game where somebody said, I had a spring in my butt last night. What are you going to do about that? We're going to go from 300 uh, uh, toilets to 450. So I didn't go to Purdue, but even I know that's like a 50% increase. And we will have a brand new Jumbotron, which will be awesome. And I think it will help the fan experience up in the balconies and really everywhere. So that'll be a great amenity. And then the only other thing in the bowl is we'll have new premium hospitality seating in the south end. I really strongly, strongly uh, believe that they should have torn it down and to build a, you know, a state-of-the-art place where there are a lot more good seats. They put $40 million into it, just a facelift. You don't walk in the front door, you don't even know it, that much has changed. Soon, after completion of the renovation, positive reviews began to come in. I think it's beautiful. I think they really did a nice job of 
uh, keeping the spirit of, of the place and bringing it into the 21st century. They spiced it up. I mean, let's face it, they've made things better. Uh, I'm sure they've made things better for the players. They've made things better for the fans. I think that's what this renovation is all about, to preserve the best home court advantage in college basketball. There's something special and unique about that building that we would never have been able to recapture in building a new arena. I'm having the old Indiana floor with the eye in the north lobby and having the old scoreboards displayed so prominently. When the lights go on and if there's a TV game, they don't need to say that it's live from Assembly Hall, you know it. Regardless of being an advocate or in opposition to Assembly Hall, those on both sides have fond memories in the building. At some time during the 1970s, uh, people found in the upper reaches of one of the stairwells uh, some wrappers, uh, a mattress, and some evidence that somebody had been living in the stairwell. There was a, a woman who worked in the balcony for many years in the student section, and if you didn't raise your hands when our team was shooting a free throw, she would screech at you in a, in a very uh, raspy voice, get your hands up, get your hands up. We probably spent about $26 million for it, and I think every penny of that was well spent. Uh, in athletics, recruiting is everything, and a big part of recruiting is uh, attracting students to your facilities. Uh, and Assembly Hall was certainly uh, the best in the Big Ten at the time it opened up. In the mid-1970s, the circus came to town, and it was held at Assembly Hall, and somewhere along the way, a Kodiak bear escaped its pen and started wandering the, the hallways of Assembly Hall, and people would stick their head out of the, their offices, and there would be a Kodiak bear. It did not make a little interesting morning for somebody coming out 8.30 in the morning, just had their coffee, and there's a bear waiting for them. Doc Trisler was an usher, and he was one of the most special people in the kind of back behind the scenes life of Assembly Hall because he made it his effort to meet every single person who worked in his section, get to know them, shake their hand, try to remember their name. He always had a soft peppermint candy in his pocket and uh, would hand that off to kids or folks that he knew. And that was his way of making that huge arena a very small and personal place. One time, Neil Diamond was getting ready to start a, a big tour. And I guess maybe he rented out the place or whatever for a week and they um, practiced his whole what his tour show was going to be and the, you know they set up and whatever and so we got a free concert every day from Neil Diamond. Some of the most famous games at Assembly Hall include Bob Knight throwing the chair against Purdue in the, in the mid-80s. The same with an exhibition game against the Soviet Union in which Knight was accused of pulling his team off the court at the end of that exhibition. My most treasured memory, watching any sport, any moment, and any game in my life, in any, and, and, and that was when Kristen Watford hit uh, that shot to beat Kentucky. Hundreds of thousands of people have remarkable memories of their time in college tied to that building. And experiences in the building, getting to the building, in the parking lot, outside the building, you know, whatever it is, Assembly Hall has stood for um, all the great things about Indiana University. Well, I think it's iconic because of uh, the association uh, and the importance of basketball to Indiana. The history of having won five national championships. I mean, I get calls from friends of mine from California who don't really necessarily want to stop by Bloomington to see me. They want to experience what an Indiana basketball game is like. When women's athletics moved into the department, they weren't expecting us and didn't design the building for additional coaches. So we decided to use the coat check area for all of our women's coaches in one area. But the coaches uh, were pleased to be in the hall, uh, enjoyed being together, and uh, it worked for a while. I'm very proud to have been a part of the legacy, if you will, um, of having played at IU, but I'm also very proud of Cindy Simon Scott and her family to step up this way. And I think that speaks to the commitment that people have about IU, IU basketball, and Simon Scott Assembly Hall.
For a DVD or Blu-ray disc of this program or other WTIU-produced programs, go online at www.shopwtiu.org. Assembly Hall Pride of Indiana is made possible by CurryAutoCenter.com, listing Curry's entire selection of all makes of new and used vehicles on Facebook and located by the College Mall on Auto Mall Road, supporting the community for more than 100 years. CFC Properties, restoring and preserving the historic presence of downtown Bloomington. CFC's revitalization projects include Fountain Square Mall, Grant Street Inn, and the Yoho General Store, also offering residential apartments, including the Kirkwood. CFCProperties.com. IU Credit Union, offering three IU Athletic debit cards featuring IU Hoosier designs, available at all IU Credit Union locations. More information at IUCU.org. IU Credit Union, we started a credit union and created a community. Meadowood Retirement Community, an active adult living community adjacent to IU, offering a community of friends and Lifestyle 360 activities for healthy lifestyles. MeadowoodRetirement.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.